Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to another RIS interview uh, where we bring you the story behind the cutting edge research that made it into our journal, the Review of International Studies, RIS. Um, today, I'm very thrilled to be talking to Dr. Julien Pomared, who has a new article in the Review of International Studies entitled Imagining Insecurity, NATO's Collective Self-Defense and Post-9-11 Military Policing in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Julia is a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Research and Study of International Politics, um, also known as uh, REPI or REPI, at the uh, uh, Un Université Libre de Bruxelles, ULB. Uh, welcome, Julia, and congratulations on uh, the article. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. So um, let's get straight down to it and start. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about yourself and your academic journey. Um, how did you get to this point and how did you become interested in this area of research? Yeah, so uh, I, I came to develop uh, a strong interest in security studies during my PhD uh, curriculum. Uh, in my doctoral thesis, uh, no available as book in French, uh, I analyzed the development of counterterrorism at NATO, especially after 9-11, and as such, in, uh, uh, in terms of, of theoretical framework, uh, my sociological approach to NATO's uh, primitive security uh, in the article mainly comes from uh, my intent in the thesis to elaborate an alternative explanation, explanatory model to uh, uh, NATO's transformation, because um, in, in the dominant literature on NATO, NATO's evolution is seen as a rational and kind of mechanical response to a changing and unstable international uh, landscape. And I wanted to uh, question this axiological uh, explanation by analyzing uh, the institutional conditions through which NATO elaborated certain images of the threats and risks that it intends to respond to. And, and so the, the sociological model I, I worked on is, is based on the analysis of how a variety of security professionals such as diplomats, military officers, engineers, uh, international civil servants cooperate and struggle for shaping the, in the, the Euro-Atlantic security policies such as war, uh, surveillance and armaments program. So the article which deal with uh, NATO's operation in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Active Endeavor, is part of my research on NATO and ultimately I came to be interested in the, in the role of a threat imagination in the making of international security, which is the purpose of the article. I see. Okay. So uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the article? Um, just a very brief outline. So we've, we've got a sort of picture of it. Yeah. So the article deals with uh, the, the role of imagination in, in the post 9-11 practice of counter uh, terrorism, which is often characterized by what we call uh, a precautionary logic. So it means that to make sure that a potential terrorist attack can be deterred, prevented, prevented or limited uh, in scale, the security organizations should act preemptively by using, for instance, a series of uh, technologies of intelligence gathering or infrastructure uh, uh, protection. So, and the aim of these technologies is to reduce the level of uncertainty of a potential attack or to limit the uh, damages of an eventual a disaster. And in, the, in this context, uh, critical security studies have interestingly argued that this precautionary path transforms the production of security into a process of imagination. So basically the fear of the potential terrorist attack, uh, similar to the 9-11, forces security institutions to reorganize their practices and prepare for some, kind, some sort of imagined worst case uh, scenario that would potentially occurred. And so in the article, I questioned this thesis, which is I see as too technologically focused by trying to understand the degree to which the precautionary imagination of counterterrorism effectively transforms uh, security uh, organized organizations. So I wanted to understand the social foundations of imagination. And my answer is that these transformations are the object of intense power struggles in security institutions and that consequently important parts of their historical identities remain uh, preserved. So in other words, the technological imagination of the terrorist risk is located in power struggles among security professionals 
where the routines of their organizations are actualized, negotiated, but not entirely uh, transformed. And in the article, I take NATO's counterterrorist surveillance of the Mediterranean Sea, Operation Active Endeavor, as a case study. Because interestingly, NATO's operation remained under 15 years uh, uh, under the Article 5 regime. So this famous collective self-defense uh, uh, clause inherited from the Cold War. And the mission expanded in scope and, and in, in, in scale why NATO's maritime forces never found the evidence of terrorist activity. So I've, I came to explore the role of threat imagination in uh, the porous struggles between NATO's military and diplomatic uh, authorities about the uh, Article 5 significance of the uh, operation. I see, that's very interesting. So um, your article is is based uh, on field research and also interviews of various actors in NATO. Um, can you explain to us how the concept of imagination helped you to structure and guide your research? Yeah, so uh, if, if I go back to the early stages of my research, I admit that I was quite skeptical about the added value of the notion of imagination to understand counterterrorism, because how is it possible for security professionals to coordinate and to have a common understanding of what they intend to fight or to do while at the same time relying on invented scenarios? So there was this, this kind of, of issue that, that made me uh, skeptical. And after several interviews at NATO, I realized that this question could turn into something more intriguing and interesting. Uh, when I was at NATO, I saw that counterterrorism was extremely heterogeneous. So terrorism was related to piracy, uh, uh, insurgency, weapons of mass destruction, migration, and it was even more as a researcher, difficult to empirically delimit. And in one of my very first interviews, uh, an international ser uh, uh, civil servant told me, tourism is like pornography. I don't know what it is, but I recognize it when I see it. And, I, and then I started to be persuaded that uh, threat imagination could have a social function. And, and I st started to ask myself, so what is this function? How are NATO's policies stabilized and ordered while depending at the same time on the fabric of vague and, and heter heterogeneous horizon of risk, especially in active endeavor, as I said uh, uh, previously. And starting from this question, I came to elaborate a model which is outlined in the uh, article that could make understandable the sociological uh, dynamics of counterterrorism uh, imaginaries. So uh, in, the, in the article, I bring to the fore uh, two, two main mechanisms just to describe uh, one of them uh, is that the heterogeneity of counterterrorism constitute a form of shared and constructive ambiguity among the diplomatic military institutions I focused on, which make possible a minimal common understanding of their mission and their cooperation, but is also the site of very intense struggle for uh, taking advantage of the sense uh, uh, of, of, of the game. Okay. Hmm. Um, okay, so um, in the uh, conclusion of your article, you state that your research has implications for scholars interested um, in the changes that counterterrorism has generated in security organizations. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this, elaborate a little bit, and tell us what those implications are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by, by this, I mean uh, two main things. Uh, the first is, uh, I would say, theoretical. Uh, one of my aims in the article is to demonstrate the added value of political sociology in the study of security. Uh, in the case of precautionary counterterrorism, it is often argued, uh, uh, as, as I said before, that the production of, of, new of new technologies of prediction has radically transformed the way in which security organizations work, which is partly true, I admit, but we also question the social environments that conditions the use of those technologies to better understand the degree to which they transform security uh, organizations. So political sociology has the theoretical capacity to relocate the use of technologies and discourses in the context of the historical routines of institutions, the concrete practices of, of power struggles among agents and their uh, habits. So thanks to 
uh, the sociological tools, we are able to identify with accuracy the organizational changes and continuities induced by the practice of counterterrorism. For instance, empirically in the case of NATO, how can we understand that the Article 5 served for 15 years to justify a maritime policing mission with no enemy, while it historically served the purpose of responding by war to an aggressive enemy? If we only look at the technologies of maritime surveillance um, and the discourse, then it becomes very difficult to uh, make sense of this paradox. But if we analyze the tensions and negotiations among NATO's diplomatic military authorities about uh, the Article 5 status of active endeavor, then we are able to measure more precisely uh, the changes that lies behind the use of NATO's collective uh, self-defense. Uh, another question can be asked, uh, why and how did active endeavor, an Article 5 mission launch in answer to 9-11 came to integrate migration control tasks 10 years later. How was that evolution made possible from counter-terrorism to counter-migration? So again, political sociology uh, is it helped me to understand the social and institutional processes uh, through which NATO's diplomatic military bodies came to agree on such an evolution. And the second uh, implication is methodological. In the article, I try to give an outline of what an ethnography of, 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 uh, of security or counterterrorism could look like. So such field works are often described as uh, impossible to conduct because of the secrecy that surrounds these, uh, these, uh, these, the, the, the wars of uh, security. And my message here is that uh, there is no reason to yell to uh, a methodological defeatism. So if security tyrants are indeed specific and require some precautions in their ethnographic investigation, this approach is achievable, I think, uh, and can be of real added value in the understanding of security policies. Thank you, Julien. So for, for us listeners um, who haven't read the article and who may uh, want to learn more, um, could you just very briefly give us the main takeaways of the article? Yeah, um, I think that as I uh, extensively uh, talked about the key aspects of the article, I would like maybe to finally speak uh, about one point. It refers to the uh, elasticity of counter-terrorism. Uh, uh, in popular culture, I mean in movies or TV shows like Zero Dark Thirty, Act of Valor, Homeland or 24, it, it leaves the feeling that counterterrorism is the archetype of a highly secret and irrationally conducted high politics, and that professionals, the professionals are literally obsessed with counterterrorism. And my message here is that the political and, and professional life of counterterrorism is infinitely more complex and, and ordinary. The way it is activated as a set of discourses or, or technological or social practices often depends on contingent social processes and even more on everyday operations of bricolage and, and, and improvisations. So counterterrorism needs to be demystified here. And, and that, that was my intent in the article by showing how NATO's diplomatic and military authorities try to resolve some of the incoherencies of their maritime surveillance, such as, for instance, at the very beginning of the operation, the difficulty of articulating the Article 5 to the 9-11 attacks, or to justify the use of warships for years to counter an absent enemy or control uh, the civil maritime uh, community in, in the Mediterranean Sea. So to finish, I would say that counterterrorism is more ordinary and banal that we could uh, uh, expect at, at, at the first place. Well, that was um, fascinating, gives us a little glimpse into your research. Um, so thank you very much for agreeing to, to be interviewed by me. Um, it's been very, very uh, nice to talk to you. Um, for those of you who um, are keen to learn more, you can read the full article on the first view section of the RIS website. Um, if you are a Visa member, you can access this free of charge as part of your membership. Um, you just need to log into your account at uh, https colon slash slash app dot sheepcrm dot com slash visa 
slash login. If you're not a BISA member, um, you might uh, want to see if you can gain access via your institution. Um, and while you're here, please do look at the BISA website, uh, which is www.bisa.ac.uk to learn more about us and see all the benefits uh, that a BISA membership can bring you. Um, so without further, further ado, uh, thank you very much, uh, Julien, for such a fascinating uh, interview and insight into your research. Um, and um, that's it. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.